grown American superfood.
I invite you to please be seated for the moment uh, while everybody continues to be seated. And then we will rise once again shortly for the colors.
I invite you to please rise. Present. Huh. Order. Huh. Ready. Wait. Ready. Set. Order. Please be seated. So just a note, uh, for after our service today, uh, services will continue out front of the building. Uh, we will hold law enforcement uh, honors. The honor guard will dismiss everyone and line us up outside, and then Josh's family will then Return and join us when everyone is in place. Welcome in the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world. We are gathered to worship, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, to remember before God our brother Josh, to give thanks for his life, to commend him to our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in our grief. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother Josh. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As we continue with our service today, in this part, we are going to remember Josh. Uh, and we have three people who have, uh, will be speaking. Uh, we will begin... Uh, with, I'm going to invite Lieutenant Colonel John Anderson of the 2nd Battalion, 136th Infantry of the Minnesota National Guard to come forward and share some words with us today. Thank you. 
A hero is defined as an individual who is admired or idolized for courage, outstanding achievements, or no, of noble qualities. I can't think of a better description to describe Josh Owen. My name is John Anderson. I knew Josh as a soldier. I was Josh's platoon leader from 2005 to 2008. Josh and I, along with many individuals here today, had the distinct pleasure of serving on the longest continuous deployment of any military unit during the Iraq War. Together we spent 22 months deployed, 16 of those months in Iraq. Josh was in my platoon the entire deployment and it was an absolute honor. Getting Josh into my platoon was not fate. Prior to deployment, my unit's non-commissioned officers got together to draft their teams. My platoon sergeant at the time, Mike Poppin, sitting with us today, had a very high draft pick, and he used that draft pick on Josh. As a young officer and new to the unit, I didn't know many of the non-commissioned officers, and I relied on Mike to select our team. Mike told me after the draft, he said, John, you should always pick Josh. The more I got to know Josh, the more I understood Mike to be correct. You should always pick Josh. Josh was a hardworking, common sense individual, understood the responsibilities of an NCO, and brought plenty of experience to our team. The fact that I should always pick Josh became evident early on in our Iraqi deployment. Our platoon was conducting a convoy escort mission near Taji, Iraq, just north of Baghdad, in the dead of the night. The convoy escort mission was not a sexy mission, but it was as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than many missions assigned. This was due to the constant threat of the improvised explosive devices, commonly known as IEDs, that were prevalent along our route. At the time, Taji, Iraq, was known as a very dangerous area, so we traveled with caution. We had four gun trucks, escorting 20 to 22 semi-trucks, and we were spread out about a mile across the Iraqi desert. Josh's truck, which he commanded, was somewhere between the 15th and 16th semi towards the middle of the rear of the convoy. At some point while heading south, along our route, our platoon became engaged uh, by intense small arms fire and initiated by an IED. After contact with the enemy, the platoon's protocol was to set up a base of fire and engage the enemy while the semi-trucks passed through the kill zone. But in this particular engagement, while the semis were pushing through the kill zone, the semis stopped, which we all know that's not a good idea when you're trying to escape an ambush. As the platoon leader, I had to ask myself, I've got to send one of my gun trucks to figure out what's going on. And it didn't take me a half a second to hear Mike Poppins' words in my brain when he said, I always pick Josh. So I sent Josh. I knew with Josh on the scene, he could figure out why the trucks had stopped, and most importantly, figure out a solution. In these situations, the platoon could be dispersed for hundreds of yards or more between trucks, meaning you need to rely on the individual at the scene to make those judgment calls. So Josh went back through the kill zone, determined a semi-truck had crashed, trapping the driver inside. Josh, along with a few other soldiers, left the safety of their up-armored Humvees in an attempt to free the driver and get him evacuated. Josh and his team worked feverishly to free the severely injured driver. Eventually they did, and along with the medic, they were able to stabilize him and save his life. This is just one of the less violent examples from Iraq where Josh lived up to the definition of a hero. And I understood from this point forward, again, I always pick Josh. I also <laughs> remember a fun side of Josh as well. As we all did, we liked to mess around with fellow soldiers, small pranks, making fun of one another. Josh led many of these pranks, but somehow was able to always remain anonymous. <laughs> Remaining anonymous kept him from being on the receiving end of too many of the antics by those guys over there. 
so it never turned into always pick on Josh. One of our favorite characteristics, and I've heard plenty of people mention it here today, that stood out to all of us was his very distinctive laugh. And maybe I would call it more of a unique style. I, I used to describe it to people like he, like a duck was trying to laugh, or Josh swallowed a kazoo, something to that effect. We just never could nail it down. Nonetheless, we all had our quirks, and each one of our quirks were exploited by our brothers in arms. Josh was included in this. During our time in Iraq, Josh had an insatiable thirst for Mountain Dew as well. His fellow truck crew members had to ensure that he was fully stocked on Mountain Dew and cigarettes for our 12 to 24 hour missions, otherwise it would be a miserable experience for everybody. He would tell me Mountain Dew and cigarettes fueled any good NCO worth his salt, and I would have to agree that's probably true. Throughout our time in Iraq, there are countless other stories of heroics by Josh. I just don't have enough today, time today to explain. But that was the nature of the business that we were in. His heroic nature and calm under pressure made him a natural fit for a law enforcement career post-military. I was sad to see him leave the military, but I fully understood why. After returning home, we didn't see one another, but that didn't mean we drifted apart. I think I can speak for many of us here that served together on the 22 months deployment. Life caught up with each of us, and we all kind of went our separate ways. But that doesn't mean we didn't think about our brothers in arms that we served with. When we did reconnect, there was never that awkward moment that a lot of us have when you meet somebody or run into somebody from your past. That connection is often romanticized in movies, and it is honest to God true. And it was no different with Josh. Overall, leading Josh in Iraq was a great honor. I will cherish for a lifetime of, of memories with Josh. And any time the memories of Iraq appear in my thoughts, there will be Sergeant Josh Owen standing there greeting me with a smile and his quirky laugh. After I received, received the word of Josh's passing, I was in complete disbelief shock and of course extremely saddened. When someone you love passes away, it is natural to want to reminisce about them just so you can have that last little moment together before the reality sets in. To remember Josh, I started digging through my army closet to find memories of Iraq in the forms of pictures, videos, and any little artifacts that we had carried along the way. I knew Josh would be in a lot of them, and I just yearned for, the, yearned for that bonding time one more minute. Our time in Iraq was long before the smartphone, so all the pictures that were taken were loaded on the CDs, or loaded onto digital cameras, loaded onto CDs, and then burned onto a computer. I have close to 50 CDs with thousands of images. I randomly selected one of those CDs, put it into my computer, randomly selected one of the hundred untitled JPEG files and clicked the first one and wouldn't you know the first image that popped up was of Josh and I. It could have been a picture of a wide open desert, a random truck convoy, any one of the dozens of soldiers I served with, but no, it was Josh and I. And not only was it the one of Josh and I, it was the picture Josh and I agreed was the picture we both loved so much of each other while we were in Iraq. I couldn't believe it, but again, I always picked Josh. I took that as a sign that Josh is doing well, and he was sending me, he's okay. Although Mike and I's mantra was always pick Josh, Josh's mantra, always pick Shannon. Josh absolutely adored Shannon, and, when it, and it was evident by the large poster he had of Shannon hanging in his room in Iraq. I'm going to embarrass you now. <laughs> While every other soldier had posters of wall or wall hangings of women that they only dreamed of meeting, Josh had a poster of Shannon in a bikini on his wall. <laughs> every guy in the company knew about that poster, even though half of them had never been in his room. And in fact, one time I overheard a soldier, a fellow soldier, I'm sorry, I overheard Josh tell a fellow soldier. I don't need your magazine, I have a poster of my wife. 
It was the funniest and the, at the same time the sweetest thing I'd heard all deployment. And I'll save Ryle the embarrassment explaining uh, any, any further information on that situation. <laughs> now, it wasn't that Josh just simply adored Shannon because of her beauty. Whenever he spoke of her, his eyes sparkled. A sparkle far deeper than lust, a sparkle that says love. No matter how bad a day Josh had in Iraq, all you had to do was ask him about Shannon, and he'd perk right up. Most guys in the platoon would have gotten crap for showing this much love, but not Josh. Everybody understood. He is in love with Shannon, and you don't mess with the guy that in love. Shannon, you were given the gift of Josh, and I'm deeply sorry he is no longer physically here. But his gift of love to you remains for you for absolute eternity. Rylan, if you had been alive while your father was deployed, I could only imagine the way he would have talked about you and the stories that he would have told. You have experienced a loss that many in this room will never experience anything this great, and it is a lot for a young boy. There will be times you'll feel alone, times you feel cheated, but in those times, please remember this room and all the people that are here. They're not just here to honor your father, they're here to support you and your mother as you transition life without your father. You may not fully understand it now, but the brotherhood and sisterhood of police and military communities will be there for you as you grow into a man. Neither of our organizations ever leave a man behind. And I'll leave you all with this. In war, there are two protectors, the guy next to you and God. I would have given my life for Josh as I know he would have for me. On April 15th, Josh gave his life for all of us. I believe God took the same advice I received from the old platoon sergeant, always pick Josh. I don't know why God had to pick Josh so soon, but I am sure of one thing, God needed a hero. Rest in peace, Josh. I will see you again someday. Until that day, take care, brother. Thank you, John. Now I invite Nathan Brecht, Chief Deputy of the Pope County Sheriff's Department, to come forward, and he has prepared some words for us as well. Wow. <clears throat> Isn't it a blessing that this building can't even hold the love we have for Josh? What a blessing. On behalf of Josh's law enforcement family, I'd like to thank you all for being here today. I've been thinking a lot about Joshua. We call him Joshua because we have a couple Joshes, and Joshua just kind of stuck. I've been asking what Joshua would do in this situation if he was sitting out here. I think the first thing he'd do is want to take this damn tie off. <laughs> and, then probably, and then he'd probably laugh at the guys that met Thursday night that thought they had their boots shiny for today. Because <laughs> it wouldn't be good enough. Deputy Josh Owen loved night shifts. No white shirts around telling him what to do. He could go hook mirrors with his buddies whenever he wanted and he didn't have to do paper services. <laughs> Josh hated paper services, so he didn't do them. <laughs> Thank God the rest of the troops picked up his slack. Josh loved nights. 
This man was your protector in Polk County as your family slept soundly. He kept watch. We have deputies that are going to pick up where he left off. But man, if you can see that guy, there's nobody else I'd rather have driving by my house at night when I'm sleeping. He's strong. His presence brought a sense of calm. You just felt like everything was going to be okay when you were around Josh. Did anybody mention Josh's laugh? <laughs> I think you're going to hear a lot about it. For those of you that know Josh, how great was his laugh? And he didn't just laugh. He often broke eardrums when he would start. There were times when we sat together in dispatch and Joshua would erupt in laughter and it literally scared me. <laughs> I've decided that I'm going to remember Josh every time I hear a crack of lightning and a roll of thunder. I remember when the sheriff's, sheriff allowed me to put Josh on the SWAT team, I was so excited. We needed a breacher. We needed a strong guy for kicking doors. And Josh was the man for that job. I'm going to remember Josh every time I see a dad fishing with his son. I'm going to remember him when I smell a campfire or enjoy an IPA. I'm going to remember him every time I get a snap of somebody enjoying their favorite beverage on a sunny day, or a rainy day for that matter. I'm going to remember Joshua every time another dispatcher or coworker tells me that they love me and that I love them. I've decided that I'm going to do that from now on. This moment proves how uncertain life can be. And I regret not telling Josh how much I loved and appreciated him when he was here. Joshua has changed me forever. And I know it's not just our office. I know law enforcement, EMS, and firemen everywhere are struggling today. Today serves as a stark reminder of the very dangers that lurk in all communities. The answer is not to give in to darkness or focus on the darkness, but to keep that light burning, keep that light on. I know that Joss has changed our community forever. In the past week, I watched as people in this community and all across the state have reached out sharing in our grief and offering to help in any way they could. We want you to know that in a time like this, every act of kindness helps sustain us. Please, wherever you are, reach out to those who serve in this way. Take care of your people and tell them that you love them. Romans 8.28 says that God causes all things to work together for good. And right now, it's hard to see. At times this past week, I've been completely overwhelmed by sadness and grief. I know many of you have felt the same and are feeling it today. But I want to encourage you to encourage all of us to keep looking for that good. For me personally, one of the really good things that's happened in the past week is I've gotten to know Josh's family better. And we've all fallen in love with them. It's true. To Shannon and Rylan and the rest of you, we thank you for sharing Josh with us for the last 12 years. To our community, we sincerely thank you all for the ways you supported us. We grieve the loss of such a great man. You have fed us, donated money, given your time and talent, placed signs and flags 
in your yards and wrote loving messages. You've hugged, hugged us and cried with us. And as I wrote this last night, I saw a blue light glowing across my county road. My neighbor's newly installed thin blue line flag flies at half staff. These things set my heart at ease and remind me that law enforcement is still a noble profession. I am grateful for a community that believes in us. We ask that you continue to put your trust in us and show your support by shining a light in the darkness. We humbly ask that you consider shining a light, blue light, in the darkness and in, ex in exchange we promise our best, we promise to do our best to serve and protect you. Willing to sacrifice our very lives for these principles we believe in. That's what Deputy Josh Owen did. He sacrificed his life in a noble profession for the principles he believed in. To my fellow officers, whenever you see a blue light shining in darkness, think of Josh. Think of Josh eternally keeping watch with you as your night shift partner. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Now I invite Josh Palmatier, Josh's cousin, to come and share some words. Nathan's right about this week. Our wives are best friends now. I learned that this week. So, My name is Josh Palmatier, and I married into the Owen family about 25 years ago. My wife Mandy is Josh's first cousin. Mandy, Josh, and Matt had this beautiful, unique relationship. They grew up together and were more like siblings than cousins. I always felt like Josh was a brother-in-law, not a cousin. Shortly after Mandy and I were married, Mandy was visiting her parents out of state, and Matt and Josh were visiting their dad in Saginaw. The boys called me up and asked what I was doing and if they could come over and hang out with me that night. I was thrilled. <laughs> The cool kids were finally wanting to hang out with me. This was it. So I said, of course I was available. I immediately called Mandy, told her the news, and my amazing wife, however, knew better. She asked me if Dan was working that night, and I said, yes. She said, oh, sweetie, it's okay. They like you, but they just don't want to be by themselves in the house. <laughs> Later that night, the boys actually did confirm that, but they also confirmed that they did like me, so it was all good. When Josh came home from Iraq, and now I've learned some extra stuff here, uh, he confirmed his affection for me by bringing me back an antique knife that he got from a kid for $5 in a can of Mountain Dew. So apparently the Mountain Dew is worth a lot of money to him though, so I, now, I, now I feel even better about that. On behalf of the entire family, I want to thank everyone near and far for the outpouring of support that we've all received. You can't go anywhere in Glenwood without seeing Josh's name or picture or without hearing some story of the connection he made with the community. Josh is most definitely looking down right now, saying, why in the world is there such a big fuss being made about me? But actually, Matt told me last night that Josh actually told him all the time what a big deal he was. So, he's probably like, okay, this is good. So, <laughs> so you all have shown us exactly what a big deal Josh really was. Josh spent the early part of his life in Saginaw, Michigan. He was surrounded by family and spent a lot of hours with Matt and Mandy and their grandparents, Elmer and Millie. Josh was Grandma Millie's favorite and liked to get Matt and Mandy in trouble for stuff. Sounds like he did that in the Army too, and kept that going. Josh was colicky as a baby and Grandpa Elmer would walk and walk with him to try and settle him down. Josh called Mandy's parents Uncle Janie and Aunt Randy for many years and was doted on by his Aunt Darlene. He spent time with his Grandpa Joe, Grandma Betty, Uncle Bill and Aunt Sally, and cousins Rachel and Melanie. 
Josh loved spending time with Grandpa Joe in his barn. When they were young, Grandpa Joe would hide from the kids and scare them. Josh and Evelyn would say, scare us again, scare us again. Matt has fond memories of going in the back 40 behind the rows of the pellet gun and shooting anything that moved. About 15 years ago, our family was blessed to add another member, Deb. Josh and Matt always fought about who was Debbie's favorite. She became an important vital addition to the family and Josh was so thankful to have her in his life. Dan and Debbie's families have become intertwined and they especially enjoy their big family Christmas every year in Michigan. My daughter, Cassidy, was Josh's first niece. He showed her picture off to all his pals in the Army, and her class at school made many care packages that went to him and his squad in Iraq. Cassidy wanted to make sure that Uncle Josh and his unit got packages at least every three weeks. My wife informed me that we spent a lot of money on postage back then. Okay, it was worth every penny. We've got great pictures of Cassidy sitting on Uncle Josh's back while he did push-ups. Josh was very excited about Cassidy's upcoming 21st birthday this June when he could give her a legal drink. We all know the guy loved his brandy. The bond between Josh and his brother Matt is as strong as iron. The brothers dealt with everything together their whole lives. Between moving around Michigan and Minnesota, crazy step-parents, and anything else they may have encountered, they always had each other. Matt told me last night that he and Josh never fought, ever. They always got along and were always close. <laughs> Matt is actually today wearing Josh's tie, speaking of ties, that he wore at Matt Milani's wedding in 2011. I tied that tie for him at that wedding and it has never been undone. <laughs> he just kept taking it on and off over the top of his head. Matt was a little concerned. He's like, I hope it's not short. It was long, so it was all good. So, Josh adored his sister-in-law Milani and their girls, me and Maisie. There was nothing better than a big, huge bear hug from Uncle Josh. Ryland's Josh's mini-me. Family says that all the time. They fished, they hunted, they boated, they swam, they did it all together. Josh is incredibly proud of the young man Rylan's becoming. We've had the pleasure of being connected to Shannon from the very beginning of their relationship. Josh and Shannon actually met while he was in Bosnia. They had mutual friends on a video call between Minnesota and Bosnia and saw each other in the background of the call and the rest is history. They spent hours talking and getting to know each other before they even met. At one point, however, Josh asked Shannon if she wanted to meet his girlfriend. Shannon was understandably shocked at this request, but begrudgingly agreed to meet Josh's girlfriend. Josh showed her a picture of a snowman with a bikini on. <laughs> in typical Owen fashion, Josh actually proposed to Shannon in the parking lot at Red Lobster by handing her the ring and saying, hey, you want to get married? <laughs> Appropriately, she made him get down on one knee, and she said yes. But then at dinner, Josh proceeded to ask Shannon, hey, you want to get married tomorrow? She said, sure. So that was their first wedding at the courthouse. We were able to be with Josh and Shannon right before they got married the second time. Mandy helped Shannon pick out her wedding dress and was able to spend time with them before Josh left for Iraq. Mandy and my daughter Cassie were also able to come out here in Minnesota for Josh's homecoming from Iraq. There are many, many beautiful memories that are going to help us along this new path. It's important to recognize that what seems to be the penultimate moment in Josh's life came when he was a junior in high school. Josh was definitely not into school. This followed him his whole life as he was notorious for not liking paperwork, just like his dad. He had threatened his parents that he was just gonna drop out of high school. Then got himself into a little trouble and had two options. Watch a movie about art or go talk to the army recruiter. He made the right choice. His journey began. He was able to go to Fort Benning for basic training before his senior year. This not only propelled him into an amazing career in the military, but also simultaneously prevented him from being able to drop out of high school. He had to finish, and thank the Lord he did. Everything changed for Josh based on that one decision, and it was a great decision. Many of you may or may not know about the close calls Josh experienced in his life. While driving a semi-truck, he was in a serious accident. He had no control of his truck and launched his semi 30 feet Dukes of Hazard style off a highway onto railroad tracks. Interestingly enough, just about a mile before that, he thought he better put his seatbelt on. He was covered in gasoline, but the truck never exploded. Josh escaped with some stitches, a severely broken nose, a busted up face, and big bruises, but was back driving the truck in three days. 
the guy was an animal. In Iraq, we can only imagine how many other close calls he experienced, but he did tell us about an IED that hit their vehicle and didn't explode. We also used to joke too that Josh got his first DUI case in Iraq. A driver from India was heading towards the base and they were supposed to stop at certain checkpoints and this guy just wasn't stopping. Josh and his team kept trying to get him to stop and finally did only to discover that he had too much to drink and was hammered. The driver was fortunate and he made it. Dan always said that every day with Josh was a blessing. Funerals have a beautiful but unfortunate way of pulling folks together to share these amazing stories. And this week has been no exception. Through these stories, there are three characteristics of Josh that have shown through. First off, Josh was a patriot through and through. He loved his country and was honored to serve. He didn't want to just go through the motions either. If he was going to go to Bosnia or Iraq, he wanted to be in the action. He knew it was dangerous, but he also knew he could help. Josh was incredibly humble about his service too. He has medals upon medals that he's earned but didn't display or talk about. When he became a canine officer, Mandy and I used, always used to say that his dogs probably knew a lot more stories than any of us did. Freedom isn't free, and sometimes bravery is being the only one who knows you're afraid. Josh was a rock. Now we all know the dude loved to lift weights. Hated to run, but loved to lift weights. Dozens of us have received Snapchats from Josh at the gym. The guy was a beast, and his partners used that. His fellow officers told us this week that they were never afraid to handle situations if Josh was with them because they always pointed back at him with his folded arms and the 24-inch python showing off and said, this guy is with them. Later on, he'd go tell his partners they were a bunch of dummies, but they still managed to keep doing it. One of Josh's famous lines <laughs> was, don't start shit you can't finish. And I think he used that often. He most definitely could finish anything he needed to. But he was also a rock in a number of other ways. Josh served briefly as the police chief of Lowry. I had the pleasure of speaking with the current chief of Starbucks, Mitch Johnsrud, this week. He also relayed Josh's disdain for paperwork and management in general. Not surprising. But remember, you don't have to be a manager to be a leader. It's been evident this week what a tremendous leader Josh was amongst his fellow officers. They respected him, looked to him for advice and direction, and thought the world of him. He had so much to offer them between his military experience, his many years in law enforcement, and the countless stories relayed to him through the years from his dad. Right now, Josh would encourage each of his brothers and sisters in the law enforcement family to be tactical. The battlefield is at your doorsteps, and you all need to continue to have each other's backs and be safe. One more paperwork story. Josh's lifelong friend Garrett related a story to me this week. Apparently, Josh hated breaking up high school parties. Didn't want to mess with the paperwork. So he got to a party, lights and siren on, watched all the kids scatter, got out of his car, started walking, not running, watching all the kids run away, except for one kid. This kid thought he could hide. Kept popping his head up, watching Josh get closer and closer to him, but never moving. Josh in his head kept saying, please get up and run, please get up and run. <laughs> the kid never did. Josh finally got to him and said, you're getting a ticket for being stupid. <laughs> and I've heard his dad tell people that before too, so. Josh was selfless. That's been a theme throughout this week. Story upon story of folks he helped out. Josh was a blessing to everyone he crossed path with, paths with, even if they didn't want him to be that blessing. He was incredibly open-minded and never judged anyone, and always wanted to help. We heard about a guy this week whose wife had committed suicide a few years back. The guy ended up going to the spot where his wife died, fully intending on joining her. Josh sat with him for six hours and talked him through it. We heard about a gal who struggled with drugs and her behavior was tearing her family apart. Josh took her to jail and told her on the way that she had so much potential. There was so much more she could do with her life. She turned things around and is doing great now. Josh never stopped trying to help people and that says a lot. It's so easy to be cynical in this day and age and there were undoubtedly people who never came around. But Josh never stopped trying. Such a beautiful legacy he leaves us. 
A local couple, Mike and Shannon Walsh, penned a beautiful post on Facebook describing Josh. As a family, we read through it this week and it moved us. So I asked them if we could read it today. I want to thank the Walsh family for this beautiful tribute. The headline reading, County Deputy Killed, isn't the whole truth. This kind of solemn language is being used often because it tries, rightly so, to convey the duty, honor, and sacrifice that guided Josh's life, career, and ultimately his death. It is effective and true. It strums at our heartstrings and makes us feel. Like the teardrop that begins to well up in your eye during the national anthem, or the tingle down your back when you watch the changing of the guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Deputy Owen and many law enforcement officers like him deserve at least this solemn language of respect. They're held to a higher standard. Their every move is recorded, every word transcribed. We stare at them when they walk into the store, curse them in our rearview mirror, and judge them when they show up on our newsfeed. They have to set themselves apart from society just to do their job. But this headline paints an incomplete picture of what happened. It's the truth of Deputy Owen of number 603. But it's not the whole truth. It's not the truth of Josh Owen, the man, the father, the husband, the friend, the neighbor. The deputy took countless drunk drivers off the road, saving innocent lives. He jumped through legal loopholes to prove guilt, dodging traffic, and risking injury. The man, however, let other people go for lesser infractions out of kindness and maybe a disdain for paperwork. The deputy often had to physically subdue the most formidable suspects. The man, however, preferred to diffuse and de-escalate tense situations, even when he knew he would easily win a physical altercation. The deputy built a career serving the government of the country and community he loved in the military and law enforcement. He worked with commanding presence and authority. The man, however, was a vocal opponent to expanded government authority and overreach. The deputy would guide a resident through a tragedy with a sense of seriousness and empathy that only a true professional could muster. The man, however, would crack a well-timed joke to take a coworker's mind off the same tragedy. The deputy took his job seriously, giving 100% of himself to the uniform, often all through the night. The man, however, went out of his way to visit his son at daycare in between those nights because he gave 100% to his role as a father too. Josh, you were always there. You were there on the couch with conversation when our shifts got boring. You were there in the patient's house doing chest compressions when I needed to set up the defibrillator. You were there in the smashed up car holding pressure while I grabbed the tourniquet. You were there on the sidewalk restraining the violent man so I could do my job without fear. You were there in our doorway thanking my wife sincerely for caring for your son. You were there over the phone inviting us to a party when we were trying to find our way in the world. You were there in the driveway showing our kids everything in your squad car. A real headline would capture the truth of the man and not just the deputy. It would capture his heart of service, his commitment to family, his sense of humor, the patriot at his core. It would call this a murder, a tragedy, a senseless waste of something good without reason. It would convey the suffering of a grieving wife and parents. It would certainly impart on us all the pain this will cause your young son. Alas, we can't write a real headline for this. We can't express that good men and women suffer and die to keep the rest of us safe. Our community gets it now. We finally understand it. We finally see it. But we need men and women like you to keep putting on a uniform, to keep being there and we can't bear to publicly recognize the cost. That's why we can't write the real headline. Joshua 1.9 states, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you always, wherever you go. Josh will always be with us wherever we go. We've seen signs already this week, and I know we'll see signs for the rest of our days. Josh's mom, Kathy, ended every call or text with Josh by saying, I love you more. And Josh took that same wonderful phrase and used it with Shannon. So Josh, we all want you to know that we love you more. Thank you for those kind words.
that you've shared. They're a great tribute to Josh. And they're kind of hard to follow. So let's continue with some scripture. A reading from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 10. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. After he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here ends the reading. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for all, all of you who have come out to support Josh's family. Not just today, but all week. I've heard a lot of great stories about Josh. Like, a lot of great stories about the guy. I never got to officially meet him, other than maybe running into him on scene a time or two where he couldn't share that trademark laugh. But after learning a bit more about him, I really wish I did. Especially after learning about his robust sense of humor and his affinity for fart jokes. I gotta say, when I learned, when I heard a story about Josh Brody, how he'd love to make a fart sound in the office when nobody else was quite in the same room and you'd just kind of see who would notice. I'm catching a theme from some of those pranks where he would remain anonymous. Right then when I heard that story, I knew Josh is my kind of guy. So to honor that memory and Josh's really unique sense of humor, Shannon, I told you, I, I promised you, I would do my best to try to find a way to play a fart sound over these speakers today. <laughs> and then I got home and wondered what did I get myself into? Because I didn't know where to start. And I'm pretty sure I, Google, I broke Google when I typed in loud fart sound appropriate for a law enforcement officer's funeral. <laughs> I think that was the first time that phrase has ever been Googled. And I think that's a testament to Josh. He was one of a kind. He's kind of a big deal. And as I've heard so many great stories shared about Josh that have brought out hearty laughter, I give thanks. Because in this time of tragedy and trauma and loss, laughter is a reminder of God's gracious love for us, bringing us hope and comfort when the road is dark. And it's a reminder of how God showed his love for us through who Josh was, through who God created Josh to be, strong, confident, compassionate, It's also easy to be overwhelmed at times with coping with his death, and that's grief. It's an assault of emotions that range from happiness to anger and despair all at once wrapped in one hell of a confusing package. And in those moments that it becomes overwhelming and too much, I invite you to remember the words we just read from Matthew 5. Also the words that were echoed from Romans 8 and Joshua 1. But in Matthew 5, we have the beginning of a much longer sermon 
that Jesus preached to the massive crowds that were following him wherever he went. The crowds were filled with people who were downtrodden, the forgotten and overlooked by society. They were sick and ill. They were distraught and looking for hope. They were us, gathered today, here in this gym, here in this building. They were us, gathered elsewhere, all around, huddled around a screen watching today's services. And what did Jesus say to that crowd of people that was so desperately looking for hope? He said, blessed are you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are you who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. These are Jesus' words to a very broken and hurting world. These are Jesus' words for everyone in our nations, for everyone in our states, and for everyone in our communities. These are Jesus' words for the people that many of you here have sworn to serve and protect. These are the words for you who protect them, regardless of who they are and what they think of you. These are the words for everyone who is flooded out to share words of comfort and disbelief. For everyone who has lined the interstates, overpasses, highway shoulders, and streets to welcome Josh home on Monday. These are the words from Jesus for everyone who is gathering together right now to comfort one another because this should never happen. These words are for you. Blessed are you who mourn, for you will be comforted. Now you might be thinking, I don't feel very blessed. I feel pretty angry. I feel a little lost. I feel confused. I feel pretty much everything but blessed. Well, then these words are especially for you. Because when Jesus says, blessed are you, he's not talking about good vibes or just be happy. When Jesus said, blessed are you, he's saying that God is showing favor on you. Theologian Frederick Dale Bruner helps us understand this when he writes, on Jesus' authority, in deep sadness, human beings are in God's hands more than at any other time. That's what being blessed means. I'm going to say that one more time. In deep sadness, human beings are in God's hands more than at any other time. That's what it means to be blessed. And how do we know this? Well, God constantly reminds us through Scripture. Jesus promised, Behold, I am with you until the end of the age. Joshua reminded us be strong and courageous do not be frightened or dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go God spoke spoke through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah in Isaiah 41 he said do not fear I am with you do not be afraid I am your God I will strengthen you I will help you I will uphold you with my victorious right hand and finally we know this to be true through the resurrection of Jesus just a few days ago many Christian churches on earth celebrated Easter the Orthodox Christian Church observed Easter just hours after Josh died on Easter Sunday, we remember that three days after he was unjustly slain by our sinful hands, Jesus triumphed over sin. Jesus triumphed over death. And he was raised three days later, 
bringing about the death of death itself. In his resurrection, death does not have the last word. It just doesn't. Because God does. God's word is resurrection. God's word is hope. God's word is blessing. God's word is for you. You are blessed because of what Christ has done. And when God has the last words, that means that Josh has also been raised to eternal life. Reunited with all those who we grieve. All those who have fallen. With all the saints who have gone before us. And they stand together in God's presence in a new life. And when God in Christ has blessed you, that means you too have this eternal life. Not on account of anything you can do, but simply on account of what Christ has done for you. So blessed are you who mourn. Blessed are you who mourn because you have received God's promise that one day we will be reunited on the day of the resurrection when God wipes away every last tear and gathers us together in his arms. Amen. And now I invite you to join me in prayer. Each prayer petition will end with me saying, Lord, in your mercy, the congregation's response is hear our prayer. God, give courage and faith to all who mourn and assure and certain hope in your loving care that casting their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your light 
and your life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection to life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, through your Son, you showed us how to love one another and protect the vulnerable and the mar marginalized. Bless and protect law enforcement officers, dispatchers, firefighters, EMS crews, ER staffs, doctors, and nurses, and others who run toward danger to keep us safe. Calm the division and anger that engulfs law enforcement officers and many communities that they serve. God, help our elected leaders to see, to hear, understand, and acknowledge the concerns of our officers so they can support them in their vocation to serve. Guide and safeguard these servants so that they may discharge their duties without fear and with professionalism, so that they continue to be officers of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we commend to your gracious care in keeping all the men and all the women of our armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and their temptations. Give them courage to face the perils that surround them and grant them a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, we give you thanks because by his death, our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death and by his resurrection, he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also and that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come will be able to separate us from your love in Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us commend Josh into the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Josh. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. Please rise.
And thank you for joining us for the funeral of Pope County Deputy Josh Owen. We will continue to stream the police honors outside of the high school on Fox9.com and on our YouTube page. We will also have a complete wrap of the day's events coming up on Fox 9 News at 5 on Fox 9 Plus and tonight on Fox 9.